welcome to episode one, Soccer Coaching Theory and Innovation. So this is my YouTube show. I'm gonna be on every other week with a new episode. And this is kind of a free-flowing show, so it's just me talking to you. This is not that scripted. So um, don't expect it to flow unbelievably, but the information is really good. So again, the idea behind this show is to give you theory behind player development of the future and what's coming in next. Like what are the next big things in coaching that are gonna change the way that we coach? So when I say it's not your regular soccer soccer show, let me just kind of give you an example. Like back in the day, how many times you go out to the field and you see the coach blow the whistle, stop, stop, hey listen, we wanna get the ball wide, we gotta get the ball wide, blows the whistle, Maybe the kid doesn't play the ball wide, stops the game again, so how many times do I tell you you need to get the ball wide, right? So that would be an example of a little older school session, right? Older school training session where the coach is just yelling and screaming to get the ball wide. Um, so where this is evolving to is I'll give you an idea of now, what if the coach put two channels down the sideline, maybe 10 yards each on each side of the field, and said to the kids, now listen, in the attacking third, in the attacking or whatever it is, the half of the field, you have to get the ball into one side, into one channel first. Once the ball enters the channel, now you can score. And so the exercise will take care of itself. The players already know we can't shoot the ball, we can't score until it enters into a channel wide. So at that point, the coach is really just there to help guide the players to help them be successful. He doesn't have to blow the whistle every two seconds and yell and scream. He's there to maybe offer some solutions and some encouragement to how to be successful, but the activity takes care of itself and the activity actually becomes, the exercise becomes the teacher. Now, it doesn't have to just be, hey, you have to get it into one channel. If you wanna work on possession, maybe you have to get it into both channels before you can score. Maybe. You know, you, you, you do those variables. If you want to work it out, getting the ball wide out of the back, maybe they have to hit the channels in the defensive third before they can move into the attacking third. Whatever it is, the idea here is we start to design exercises that are challenging, but at the same time, the exercises force the creativity out of the players. It forces the players to learn what it is that we're trying to teach them without us as coaches having to blow the whistle every two seconds. Um, I'll give you an example now of the, the Dortmund coach, the old Dortmund coach, Thomas Tuchel, and he's at PSG now. He wanted to work on diagonal balls, right, for his team from coming out of the back. And he didn't, again, want to start blowing the whistle and yelling and screaming, so what he did, again, he made a field in a diamond shape and he cut the corners off the field. What that means is you're forced to play diagonal balls. There is no, there is no other balls to play. So by using that diamond shape, again, he forced the creativity out of players by using this new type of field. So I'll give you an idea what that looks like. It's pretty interesting here. So here's the field that he created. So. This is a big field, obviously you can adjust this for whatever size field you're playing on, but the blue areas, you're not allowed to go into. So you can see if the back has the ball, really, it can't hit a long ball down the channel. It has to hit longer diagonal balls. So again, this is an idea. Thomas Tuchel at the highest level using these types of training ideas. And when I look at this, Guardiola is a guy, obviously, that I look at as an innovator. And in Guardiola's style, how many times do you see players drive the end line, play the ball back on the ground? And in my opinion, in soccer, there's not too many times now that you see these long, often crosses to the back post too many times. Many times now, you're seeing players drive the end line, ball the feet on the ground to finish. So maybe, you know, if you're Guardiola, you say, hey, in this blue area is the only place you can Cross the ball from, and maybe you extend this blue area out into here. Boom! So you start getting crosses on the ground back into the back into the box. Just an idea about um, how to use, how to make up exercises that force the behavior you're looking for. So.
Duchelle's methods are, are vast. It's not just ending on a diamond field. So I'll give you an idea, and I can remember the Dortmund president or CEO, whoever that was, saying they were very skeptical at first watching this guy come in and work with the first team because he had such cutting edge training exercises, they weren't really sure how it was gonna go over with the players. So I'll give you one or two of the things that he did. One was he had his defenders hold tennis balls while they were playing in the game. And what that does is it doesn't allow you to grab the shirt of the opponent. It doesn't allow you to really use your hands like you normally would. So it's forcing better one-on-one -on -one defending. You have to take up better positions because you can't rely on that little extra advantage of having your hands. Next, he would wet the field. Obviously on a wet field, the ball goes through a little bit quicker, further making the, the defenders anticipate and think one step ahead. Now they're holding tennis balls in their hand. Now the field is wet. They have to be smarter. They have to anticipate. He's training the soccer IQ and the soccer brain without even having to say much. So, when you look at a lot of these world-class managers, right? They sh th their deal is this. They don't want to fall behind. They want the latest thing what's out there. They're paranoid of falling behind. They don't want to ever lose. They don't want to be surprised. They want to be the innovators. They want to be the ones on top. And it's a, ne a never-ending pursuit in professional development and they're researching every day, they want the best information, and that's why the best coaches stay on top. Now, for me, when it comes to coaching, we have to say, you know, there's two different things. One is player development, and then one is when you're coaching in a, in, in a league and you need to win games today or tomorrow. I'm talking about player development right now. So what do I think the player of the future is gonna be like, and what are the methods that are gonna develop the player of the future. And when we talk about the player of the future, in my opinion, developing the player of the future has nothing to do with the physical side. So the trainers, the nutritionists, the exercise people, they've already done it. The sprinting coaches, the running form, it's already been done. We've maximized players' physical ability to as much as we're gonna go. But what we haven't done is we haven't maximized the soccer, IQ, the soccer IQ, soccer intelligence, game intelligence, whatever you want to say. And what I'm talking about is players who make quicker decisions and players who have more solutions to problems on the field. So when, I, when Messi's on the ball, how many different solutions does he have compared to other players? And that's a big deal. And that is what about developing the soccer IQ and soccer intelligence is all about. More solutions, quicker solutions, thinking quicker, picking the right pass, making the right decision. However, the flip side of that is, even if you make the right decision, if you don't have good technique that you can execute at fast speeds, making the right decision is not going to matter. You still have to have technique to go with that. So, increasing soccer intelligence, soccer IQ, along with excellent technique, for me, that's what the player of the future is going to be about. Now, we haven't talked about psychologically the player of the future, because people change. It is the age of millennials, the ultra millennials, and how we go about coaching and developing players from a psychological standpoint is also going to vary as well. And we will get into that point at a little later date. Now, since we're in America right now, one of the things in America, the reoccurring themes in soccer coaching and soccer development is how come America can't produce, has never produced really creative players? And I'll say that we have produced maybe Clint Dempsey for me. He was a really creative player. I thought he was world-class at what he did. But we've never produced a world-class goal scorer either. And, you know, this is, this is a big topic of conversation, especially in, in, in college as well. If you look at, at top uh, NCAA college soccer, most of the teams don't play. 
it's, it's a big time six foot four in the back and we thump the ball and so forth and we look for set pieces. You don't see too many teams that come out and play. And what I will say is, in a country the size of the U.S., how come we don't have these players? Is there something in our methods as coaches, player development, and this is a long conversation about culture as well, is there something we're missing? So how does a country like Croatia, okay, and there's some very good stats about Croatia. How does a country of 4 million people compared to 300 million people in the U.S. go to a World Cup final, produce the best player in Europe, have world-class goal scorers? If you look at Croatia, we've never lost, America has never lost to Croatia at the U14 level, but we've never beat them at the older levels and the senior national team level as well. For me, it's pretty simple. It's at the younger levels, the physical aspect of the game is too much. So the players don't have that technical proficiency yet, and they don't have that hard drive. They don't have that soccer IQ, that soccer intelligence built in yet. So they're unable to overcome the physical part. But as they get older at the senior levels, now the teams like Croatia have they have the quick thinking players who have the solutions to problems on the field and they're technical enough to overcome all the physical attributes of say the American team, right? So this is very, very important when it comes, again, you're looking at 300 million people to 4 million people. You're looking at teams like Holland who have won the European Championships, who have gone very far in the World Cup. The, the, they made the final not too long ago. You're looking at teams like Iceland, which I think it was 300,000 people who have done so, so well. What are we missing as coaches and in the player development piece? When you look at the MLS, it's it, a couple years ago, and I think it got a little better this year with Portland and Seattle, but teams who held the ball less, so the least possession in the MLS, the teams who had the least possession in each game ended up winning more games than teams who had more possession. This does not happen in Europe like that. If you're looking at, at Man City, if you're looking at Barcelona, if you're looking at Arsenal, the, these teams win games. If you can hold the ball, you can have meaningful possession with good quality teams, that means a lot. What it says to me is in the MLS, the possession wasn't meaningful. And what that means is that maybe we don't have the players in the MLS who can break down the other teams and hit those penetrating through balls, combine in the areas of the field that in the attacking third, the combination play in the box, finish, so forth, we're lacking that. So at the end of this discussion, it's, we can probably agree on that it takes years and years of development into the soccer intelligence, soccer IQ, and on the technical part, just like we saw with the Croatia U14 teams, by the time that they're at the senior level, now they're world class. So it, it's not a quick fix, and sometimes I think that's why in the college game, you know, it's, it's just a couple years you have those players, and there's maybe not that much development taking place, so people are building their teams like the Stoke Cities. Let's move on. So, one of the things that I'm big in, and I think that the future of soccer, the future of soccer coaching, and the methods that we use are going to revolve somewhat around constraint-based training. So, let's talk about constraint-based training, the definition of a constraint. So, the definition of a constraint is Right here, the definition of a constraint is the introduction or natural occurrence of something that creates a boundary or a limit, which makes some actions possible and leaves other actions up to the learner to explore. So, I know that's kind of a fancy definition, but basically what it's saying is, I'm going to take away some things from the player in the game, whether I say you can't hit a pass more than 10 yards with your left foot, right, or you can't hit a pass more than 10 yards with your right foot. That means that every long distance pass you have, have to hit is going to be with the other foot. So if my weak foot is the left foot, if I'm forcing that action, I need 
I need to become successful at that, at that action. Maybe you're taking, just like Tushal with the diamond field, maybe he's taking away the corners of that field. So how do I adjust my game to be successful with those constraints? You know, maybe the constraint is the coach found a way to take away your speed. Maybe you have to have a speed constraint thing where you hold a stick behind your back, whatever it is, and you can't run at full speed. Well, that's a constraint, right? So let's, let's go a little bit deeper into the theory of, the, of constraints. So it's been shown if a person has no constraints, so if I just tell you, hey, you can go out and play, there's no restrictions, no constraints, nothing, you have complete freedom um, over what you do on that field, and actually what happens is you become less creative. When you have every option available to you, when a player does, the player reverts back into the same habits and doing the same thing over and over again that they've always done. They try to get out of the situation, they try to solve the solutions using the same exact things that they've always done. Re reverting back to the comfort zone that they've always been in. But if you have constraints, you become more creative and resourceful as you, become, as you, as you try to become successful within the framework of the limitations, right? And people who work in constraint, uh, constraint training environments, const uh, environments with constraints, they figure out ways to become successful and they actually become more creative. That's a little bit of the theory behind it. Um, and that's important to understand when you're trying to develop exercises for soccer. So constraints can be broken down into a couple categories, individual constraints. So if you're six foot five, your center of gravity is high, obviously that's gonna be a constraint. Maybe you can't turn on the ball like Messi, so that's a constraint of yours. Your fitness, if you're not in good shape, your strength, your speed, your aerobic capacity, all these kinds of things, concentration, focus, emotional control, all these things are individual constraints, right? Environmental constraints. So environmental, obviously if you're playing on a muddy field, what if you're playing on a beach? What if you're playing on a bumpy field? Those are environmental constraints. Task, task constraints, um, these are things that coaches can, can manipulate, right? Um, so those, those are things like, you know, the equipment, the size of the, you know, if you want to make your grid small, big, the number of players, maybe you want to add plus players, maybe whatever that is, that's a task constraint. Those are the things that the coach can manipulate. Um, all these things combine together to make up one learning environment. And the trick is for the coach to use the right constraints or a combination of constraints to bring about a learning environment to construct a learning environment that's good for the players and it's going to develop them in the way that that you want to develop them um, so a little bit deeper look into the specifics of constraint based training um, here's an example with golf so golf is notorious for something called rope training so you get on the golf course right and you go to the driving range everyone's going to the driving range and you take shot after shot after shot on the, on the driving range. The problem with that is, after a while, it's not challenging enough. It's rope training. Yes, you put that into your hard drive, you, your muscle memory is there, but there's not much benefit you're gonna get after staying on the driving range and you've got that swing down. That's it. So what, what constraint training on the golf course looks like is, maybe you're going to use a variety of, of swing motion constraints. So maybe instead of you know, hitting your seven iron with a full swing, now you have to practice on half a swing, a quarter a swing. Because when you're on the golf course, what if there's a limb? What if there's a tree limb? What if for some reason you're in the sand trap? Whatever it is, swing constraints, right? Now, there's, there's plenty more of those. You can use the natural layout of the golf course to create constraints. So if, if the ball, any, you could say that if the ball ever lands in the left rough, which is you have a fairway and maybe the rough is to the left of it, right? It's out of bounds. So now you're gonna have to adjust your game. So it's basically, maybe you only have four clubs, right? Four golf clubs instead of 20. And you have to play the entire round um, with four golf clubs, right? So now you have to figure out how do I make these golf clubs work for me? and new ways to use them. So, soccer-specific constraints, right? 
when I was growing up, I was never the fastest kid. And I always had a theory about that in the fact that in order for me to play at a high level, I was forced to adapt my game and become more technical and more skillful than the players who were fast. And the fast players, for me, didn't get themselves in situations where they were forced to develop this type of thinking and that type of skill set because most of the times they just relied on their speed. So pushing the ball past people, running by, and scoring, and scoring goals. So I always knew that a physical constraint developed players in different ways. And that probably is not a good thing. So I'm going to talk about constraints a little bit, how a coach can implement, say, some of the constraints. So again, I mentioned for a, for a second before, a limit on speed. Um, so task constraints, some examples were reducing the field size, using small-sided games uh, that limit space. So it, when you're gonna when you're gonna limit speed, right? So if you make the field really small, it takes away the speed aspect and it forces that player to develop a, a, a different skill set. Touch restrictions. If you're limiting to one or two touches, the speed aspect goes away a little bit, right? If you insert a one touch box in the game, that kind of levels things out a little bit. Um, Restricting forward passing options. Um, there's so many things that you could do as a coach. Like the speed factor, again, I have something called a speed constraint where you put a, a, a bar behind your back with two handles and you hold it, and you cannot run and sprint at full speed when you have a bar and two, uh, two handles behind your back because it's not a natural running form. That forces the faster players to think differently and develop a different skill set. So there, there's tons of constraints. Um, environmental constraint, um, it could be beach soccer, it could be letting the grass grow longer to decrease the, 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 the weight of the ball travels. Um, it, it, there could be a number of things with environmental constraints. I actually designed a ball that has uh, external, we'll call them like, like uh, bubbles that come out of it, like raised panels, so it makes the ball bounce all over the place when you're playing. And that's to simulate a bumpy field because you'll notice that players who grow up with, you know, having to play on the beach, playing on, the, on, on bad surfaces, create different skill sets, right? And they, they learn to receive the ball differently and so forth. constraints that I haven't touched on yet is a social cultural element so we'll call it a, a social cultural constraint basically what that means is wherever you are say if you're growing up in Brazil and everyone dribbles the ball and that's kind of what they they take their pride in is these special skill sets 1v1 ability da 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 that's going to influence the player if they're in that culture, they watch the Brazilian professional league every day, they play on the street with their friends, and this is what everybody is doing, that's a cultural constraint. And this can go on at the club, maybe if you're, if you're at, again, I keep hammering Stoke City, but if you're at Stoke City and you try to use too much skill, you know, maybe they're gonna shun that and tell you to hit 50 yard ball. So there's, there's a constraint, whether it's with your country, whether it's with your club, we'll call that a, a social cultural constraint. Now, here's some constraints to think about. Neymar playing futsal. He said this was a huge development in his game. He played futsal until he was 13 years old, and then obviously at 13, 14, you have to go to the, the pro club and start playing outside. But huge to his development. And Ronaldinho playing beach soccer. He said at Barcelona, he would take touches on the grass at Barcelona when he's playing, that people don't understand because he developed those touches in beach soccer. And if you think about it, beach soccer, environmental constraint, it's a different game. Ozil for, for Germany and Arsenal said playing cage soccer is what, what developed his ability to hit penetrating balls. And cage soccer, he used to meet his brother his old, and his older friends 
in a concrete uh, concrete playing surface with a metal cage around it so the ball couldn't go out. He said the players were faster than him, stronger than him, and the ball couldn't go out of bounds. So he had to develop his soccer IQ, his soccer brain. He had to execute technique at lightning speed, and he had to think faster than everybody. Tell me that's not a constraint. That's a huge constraint, huge constraint, huge constraint. All these constraint-based training methods right here, this developed great soccer players who were able to transfer what they learned from playing with constraints to the real game and become some of the best players in the world. Peter Cech works with a cognitive coach, catching ping pong balls. He has so, so many different methods that he uses in his training that is outside of the norm that would be considered constraints. Terry Henry talking about playing around uh, flipped over uh, whatever grocery carriages in the, in, in, the, in the parking lots, using those to strategize, dribble around, so forth. And just another example of how constraint training has produced some of the world's best players. And a lot of people don't look at that as constraint training, but for me, that's really what it is. So here we have the, the, the Matthew May, the laws of subtraction. Recent studies offer evidence that contrary to popular belief, the main event of imagination, creativity, does not require unrestrained freedom. Rather, it relies on limits and obstacles. Constraints, right? Here we have Marissa Mayer, the CEO of Yahoo. Creativity is often misunderstood. People often think of it in terms of artistic work. Unbridled, unguided, uh, unguided effort that leads to the beautiful effect. But if you look deeper, you'll find that some of the most inspiring art forms, Beku, Sonatas, religious paintings, are fraught with constraints, right? Again, this is just more theory um, behind constraint-based training. This is, I'm not gonna read this whole thing to you, but this is just basically a couple brothers who in June 11th, 1962, broke out of Alcatraz. Um, obviously the only people to ever break out of Alcatraz, and they did it by being very creative, working inside, you know, obviously a lot of constraints to break out of prison. They used rubber cement, they used raincoats to make a raft, they glued it together, they used other things to make a fake body to put under the bed so the guards would still think they were sleeping. So it's just another example of how creative people can be and how they use constraints. So let's talk about constraints now in soccer. So I'm gonna go through these rather quickly. So how can you use constraints in soccer? Um, we can look here, we have how to teach defensive compactness using horizontal zones. We split the field into three zones, and here's the rule. The blue team is possession, the red team must fill. If they're in possession in this first zone, the defensive zone, the red team must stay compact defensively by filling one zone, two zones, this zone has to be three. So this keeps it compact, so two out of the three zones, the middle zone and the zone with the ball, have to be filled. If the ball moves here, it'll be this zone and this zone that have to be compact. So teaching compactness by just using zones, that's it. And if you notice, the exercise does the teaching. As we build this up, now we teach horizontal compactness and vertical compactness at the same time. So now we say, not only if the ball's here, the red team doesn't only just have to be here and here. Now vertically, they have to just fill this zone and this zone. So now you have defensive compactness and the, and the players can self-correct because once you, uh, once you tell them, hey, this is the rules of the game, these are the constraints, it forces defensive compactness horizontally and vertically. On the, on the flip side, the blue team can work on spreading out the entire field, right? Working on a width, depth, everything like that. So red team tries to work on compactness as the blue team is gonna to try to open them up. Here we have just an example of splitting the field into three channels. We're teaching attacking width. So the team with the ball, they're trying to score on two small-sided goals, and just to teach attacking with, simple. In order to score, you have to have a player in every zone. 
So if you score and each zone doesn't have a player in it, no goal. That forces attacking the win. So if you put this player in here, no goal because there's no one in this zone, right? Next, working on switching the field, getting the ball wide. In order for a team to score in a small sided goal, they must play through one of the red gates. Simple, very, very simple. Here's another one. Everybody's probably seen this. It's the one touch box. So again, this is a constraint. You have to play one touch within this box. It brings about different mindsets. It brings about, again, this builds, this builds the hard drive. It, it gives this player, it puts them in a position they normally, they have constraints. They don't have every option available to them. Now, most people do this one touch. What if you did, you had to take four touches in this box. Now you have to be really good at shielding the ball and being comfortable on the ball because each player in this box, minimum four touches before you pass it. Obviously, most of the time we do this with one touch, but again, this is just different experiences, different learning environments, and the constraints um, help build a more well-rounded player. Here's another idea. Maybe you, again, one, two, three, maybe nine different zones here, and maybe the, 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 the rule is that three passes, so maybe it's one, two, and the third pass has to travel to a different square. And what that forces it to do is work on ball circulation. It works on the team spreading out, getting into their attacking organization shapes, and so forth. Maybe, you know, there's all types of things you can do. Maybe this team is working on pressing. So if the ball's in one box, maybe you have to require two players to automatically be and press in the box where the ball is if you're going to work on the red team pressing. And you can see that the practice is already organized because of the zones. Because, and then you just have to put in the rules that you want the players to follow, and that will teach. So if you say, hey, it's got to be two pressing in, in the box where the ball is, and then maybe after two press, maybe you have to have one, one, and one in the area surrounding. Not a bad idea. So again, you could use this on the defensive side, you could use this on the ball circulation side, maybe you have to connect three passes and the fourth one is out if you're going to work on a more possession, ticky-tacky type of style. Depends what you want to do. So here's obstruct, so this, this is, we'll call this obstructed vision soccer training, and this is about a constraint, right? So all this does is it forces players to lose peripheral vision. And we know that players with more head movement complete more passes and two thirds more forward passes than players with less head movement. We know how important it is for players to get current information about what's around them. The best players, Xavi and Ernesto, they're always scanning, they've always got that head movement looking over their shoulder. So if you take away their peripheral vision, it's going to force more head skin. So how do we do that? Well, this is an exercise that we do that in, but let me just show you uh, quickly. Let me see if we have it here. How we do that. Hold on. I might have it on this side. I do. Let me flip through here. So here we go. This is... Something that I developed here, this is basically swim goggles, right? And we painted the outside, this part, so about one third of the vision here is now we've taken away the peripheral vision on this one and we've taken it away here on this one. So when you play with these and you play regular games, regular possession games, your line of sight is now, normally peripheral vision is this. How far can you hold your arms apart and see both hands, right? Now those glasses cut that peripheral vision to here. So from here compared to normally what is here. So from here, this means you have to constantly be moving your head, more head movement. You're playing with a major constraint. How does that affect players? Hopefully that makes players scan, uh, start to scan the field 
as an automatic habit, right? I know that at, at Liverpool and the academy, you know, they, they, they preach, make sure before you receive the ball that you can see both goalposts, right? It's kind of something that they say. Um, here's another idea, off-center goal. So maybe if I am, if I am a right-footed player, I'm gonna be going towards this goal, so I'm always getting the ball on my right foot, which makes it harder to shoot compared to my left foot. It, it's another different learning environment, right? So, so let me just sum up today. Um, Constraint-based training. So we gave the ideas of if you let players have unlimited touch, full freedom, do whatever you want, just go out and play, that's not the greatest for player development. That's creating an environment where every option is available to the player and they often are not challenged, they, they don't force themselves in, they go back to the same habits that they've always had and using constraints forces people into new situations. And here's, the, here's the, what really happens with constraints. You develop a unique and new skill set to overcome the constraints that you're dealing with. So if you, all you do is play on a bumpy field, right? You're gonna develop different body positions and different ways to control the ball, to deal with the constraint, the environmental constraint of a bumpy field. Once you've played on that bumpy field long enough, that skill set is going to be a special skill set that you now have. And you can use that at the right time on a regular turf or grass field. And the more special skill sets that you can get from constraint-based training, the better player you're going to become. And we talked about the player of the future having more options available to them on the ball and being able to make quicker and smarter decisions. We're talking about developing soccer intelligence here, not the physical part, the soccer intelligence part. Constraint-based training, for me, is gonna play a huge role in the future of player development and the future of soccer coaching. So if you want to learn more about constraints and constraint-based training and the theory, I just touched a little bit. I have a lot more on it. You can check out my books on Amazon.com. Developing Soccer Intelligence, Part 1 and 2. I have a Cognitive Soccer Instructors course, parts, uh, modules. So that Instructors module, uh, Part 1 through 5, is also available on Amazon. I also have a book called Se uh, Restricted Sense and Constraint-Based Theory and Training for Soccer. Um, that book goes into more detail. And my course, my soccer course, is at SoccerSmartTraining.com. It's a study at your own pace course. It's a five part. Um, if you're interested in consulting, I'm willing to look at consulting projects. Uh, you can email me at coachdbernardo, uh, coachdbernardo at gmail.com for outside consulting work. Uh, my podcast is going to be on iTunes. That's going to start in a week. And that's about strategies for develop a winning soccer program or club. Um, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the show. Every week or every other week, the show is going to be on. And we're going to continue to dive into the ideas, the theory behind soccer training, the cutting edge methods and the innovation that top coaches are using today. What I foresee is on the horizon in the next stages of player development. We'll see you.